Pei, and it is about uh, anomaly cancellation in string theory uh, from homotopy theory. Um, hello, is my microphone on? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Well, I just wanted to say I, I, I just like to thank everyone so much for, ha um, for the opportunity to speak here, and I hope you enjoy my talk. So I'm going to talk about, as mentioned, anomaly cancellation in string theory using homotopy theory, specifically boardism. And so um, this, is, this is a, the idea of this, of this talk is using, you know, you have a question in physics. Here's, here's a theory of some sort, you know, maybe a field theory, maybe a supergravity theory. It has an anomaly. Is that anomaly trivial or not? And what I want to convey in this talk is how to go from that question to a precise math question and then solve the math question. And then, you know, going back to physics, what does that imply? So, you know, I don't, I don't know string theory very well, especially compared to everyone here. I'm a mathematician. I specialize in, in the mathematical computations, the homotopy theory that, that makes this happen. And so, well, first of all, I'd like to thank this, this list of collaborators who I've had a lot of fun working with and who have taught me the string theory that I do know. And um, so hopefully, well, I think hopefully the, the, the style of the talk, the, um, let me try that sentence again. Yeah, so I tried to write a talk that, was, that struck the right balance between physics and math. Um, hopefully you, you will also find that to be the right balance. So um, let's see, there, there is the, um, what I'm talking about, I'm going to mention a couple specific projects with uh, Marcus D. Regal, Jonathan Heckman, and Miguel Montero, a project with, um, let's see, Ivano Basile, Matilda Delgado, um, Miguel Montero, and then a couple projects and some ongoing work with Matthew Yu, who is here. So um, why don't I go ahead and get started? So as I said, the goal of this talk is to take some tools from algebraic topology and solve some math questions which have some, which have some interesting consequences in string theory. And what, what do you want to get out of this talk? So one potential thing for you to get out of this talk is, well, what is boardism and why should I care about it as a string theorist? Um, another question which I, which I sort of alluded to is, well, you know, I as a mathematical physicist, I'm in the business of looking towards physics as inspiration for, for math theorems to prove. So in this setting, what does that look like? And building on those, another question might be, well, okay, so given that, what is being done? What do people know? What's easy and what's hard? Or maybe what's uh, easy, easier or harder? And the thing about this, this kind of calculation, this, this sort of deal is, there's a lot of different ways you could do this problem. You, there's so many different theories that people study, quantum field theories, uh, supergravity theories, string theories, and various symmetries you could put on them. And so there's an enormous number of calculations you could make. So how do you know before trying a calculation that it's a reasonable calculation to try? You know, how do you know going in that it's not going to be insanely hard? So um, some terms and conditions apply. Um, at, at, at this point, I, sh I should um, mention them. So the first one is um, people mean lots of things in physics by anomaly. I am by no means saying everything about anomalies, and I don't want to give off the wrong impression. So people sometimes uh, say Tuft anomaly for the kind of thing I'm going to talk about. And um, if at some point you're thinking, wow, for what he's saying and my conception of anomaly, none of this makes any sense. Um, you know, I, then what's most likely is that there's just a, it's just different, different things under the same umbrella and that the, the tools that I'm using don't apply to that case. Um, another thing that I should mention is, you know, I'm gonna say anomaly of string theory a lot. And this is kind of a mathematically contentious phrase. So um, I mean this in the, in the sense of, you know, putting on, a, putting on the mathematician's hat where if you, if you say theorem, everything should be precisely like, well, this thing is precisely defined and the, pro the proof in principle could be in, broken into steps of mathematical logic. And okay, if you say this and then you say anomaly of a string theory, the obvious question is what do we mean when we say a, um, the anomaly, like what do we mean by string theory? And so, you know, if you want to say the anomaly of a quantum field theory, you can say, okay, I've, before I take the path integral, I have all these formulations. Like I, I have the fields, I have, um, you know, maybe I have an action, and that much is mathematically defined. So talking about an anomaly there is okay. 
But with string theory, this, this is even hairier. And so I, sh you know, I shouldn't do that. So sorry in advance for doing it. Um, when I say that, I'm going to, I'm going to mean, let's look at the, um, mathematically precisely, we're looking at the supergravity uh, low energy limit, uh, where, where you can really say this. And so now if I'm talking about that, well, you know, anomalies are things that we evaluate on a space-time manifold. And evaluating supergravity on, on a space-time manifold, again, like, you know, if you say that, it sounds a little funny. And so, you know, before, you, before in supergravity you do this sum over, um, over various backgrounds. And so this story is taking place before you do that. So hopefully, this, uh, hopefully with these disclaimers, things will, things will be all sound. But if anything seems up, please do let me know. I'd, I'd rather know about it. And then we, uh, we can try and figure out what the, um, what the common ground is. So I've noticed that if you ask four people in mathematical physics what an anomaly is, you should expect to get at least five answers. <laughs> I'm going to give you one. Well, a little less than one. So um, let's say that you have a group acting on a vector space. You, know, you, have, a, you have a representation. Um, in particular, I'd like to draw an S right here. Um, let's see if I can do that with the, I cannot do that with the pointer. So pretend that it was a vector space, not a vector pace. I'm sorry about that. So um, I'm glad the pacing of the talk is going well, at least for a start. So OK, a group acts on a space, a vector space. You've got a representation. And what, what do we know? OK, it's, a, it's through linear functions. They send lines to lines. And so what that means is they send points to points when we pass to projective space. OK, great. But you, you can't go backwards. If I have a group action on projective space, there's no guarantee that it lifts to a linear action. So the, the famous example is the spin one half representation of SON, which is only a projective representation. And so you've got a nice action on, um, on say, CPN that does not lift to CN plus one. You know, alternatively, you could say, well, what if I lifted to the spin group? But that's, that's sort of a separate story. So this is really a fact about, like, this whole thing is really a fact about quantum mechanics. So, so quantum mechanics is projective. This, you know, really we should be, you know, when we talk about states in quantum mechanics, we're talking about the projectivization of the thing we usually call the state space, the, the Hilbert space of states. But what do people do? What do we all like to do? We work with the Hilbert space. And so, and various constructions actually require working with the Hilbert space rather than projectivizing. And so, for example, gauging asymmetry. So if you have an action and it, uh, if you, if you have a symmetry of the theory in the sense that it sends states to states on the projective, on the uh, projectivization, but it does not lift to the Hilbert space, well, that's kind of a headache because the way we prefer to work with quantum mechanics, or at least I prefer to work with quantum mechanics, is incompatible with the symmetry. And so that is, that is an example of an anomaly. Is a, it's a projective G action that does not lift to a linear G action. Okay. So um, what we'd like to do is bring this concept from quantum mechanics into quantum field theory, quantum gravity, et cetera. And so we need to sort of make this work. You know, you need to be able to feed space time to this story. And so now, what, so now what do we have? We have associated each choice of, sp of uh, background space time manifold. We've got some sort of obstruction. And it ought to be, like everything in quantum field theory, it ought to be both local and unitary, whatever that means, which I have not and will not define right here. But this is some sort of function on space-time manifolds. It's local and it's unitary. OK, so you, know, we, you might be thinking, I know lots of things, which, which are those. Since you're talking about um, the Hilbert space and its projectivization, shouldn't you be work using the word space, not space-time there, when you said it's, you have uh, such an obstruction at each point? Oh, this is a good point. Um, let me see. You are exactly right. Um, Yes, okay, let's, let's say, 
yeah, let's say space here. And um, sorry about that. Okay, so yeah, thank you for the correction. Let's say let's say space here. Um, there's, there's other ways to think about anomalies where you start with what's going on with partition functions, and it seems like I got the two mixed in my head, so sorry about that. Uh, while, was, was that the extent of your question? While we're stopped, has anyone got any other questions? Okay. So, all right, we've got some data which, you know, what, whatever the obstruction is, wherever that lives, it's, it's something. It's, you know, that, that something actually ends up uh, it's, it's an element of a cohomology group, so it's got some sort of linearity structure. It's local, it's unitary. And so following that line of reasoning, you might guess that the anomaly itself is a quantum field theory. Or, sorry, is a field theory. And there, there is a way to make sense of this precisely through what's called anomaly inflow. And so um, I learned this through, through its, um, the mathematical incarnation of a relative quantum field theory, which is due to free telemann. So the takeaway is, the, the data of these obstructions assemble into a field theory, but if you start it off with an n-dimensional field theory, the anomaly is in n plus one dimensions. So in addition, you know, it's not just any field theory. It's got to be pretty simple. It's got to be very, very simple. Um, and the, the condition that ends up happening is that these, these spaces of states of this field theory are one-dimensional. And so such a theory is called invertible. Uh, which is a notion defined by Dan Fried and Greg Moore. So um, technically, the definition of invertibility, a priori, it's not the same as what I wrote down here, but in all reasonable situations, they are equivalent. So, okay, now I, so I want to know what are all the possible anomalies, which means I want to know what are all the, the possible, well, unitary invertible field theories, but do, um, since since the, the mathematical way people think about this is more, more typically in Euclidean signature, uh, you, you end up wanting to discuss reflection positive invertible field theories. And now something wonderful happens, which is someone's classified them all. So this is the theorem. It's got some symbols that like, I have not yet explained, so that's what I'm gonna do next. But what I wanna show you is the, um, like a couple salient features, like the structure of this theorem, and then we'll discuss the pieces, and then we'll see the theorem again. So, um, Dan Fried and Mike Hopkins did, um, did a large part of this, conjectured the non-topological part, and then Dan Grady um, proved the non-topological part. So, there's, so first of all, what is there to say? That if we pick a dimension and we pick this psi structure thingy, which I'll, I'll say, say about in a minute, then invertible field theories are an abelian group. So that, that's already a nice salient feature. And so, um, and that structure is tensoring them together. So, okay, there's that. And if you know them, if you, if, if you want to know what that is, oops, that is not what I meant to do. Well, you can get that by, by um, obtaining some other abelian groups and putting them into a short exact sequence. So we need to figure out what those other abelian groups are. And, okay, so you want to know what the possible anomalies of a quantum field theory are. You calculate the sub and the quotient groups. You say, very good. You check how they extend. That extension is actually always going to split. And then you know what the anomalies are. So let's figure out what these, what these things are, these omegas. And then we'll be able to, to calculate what anomalies are. And then you know, maybe actually address the anomalies themselves in some cases. So that's the name of the game. Um, wait, C modules? Um, I think the best answer to your question is that I'm, I think that is not literally true, but it's, it's like very close to being true. Like the, this, um, what's a good way to think about it? Um, So the, one way in which this appears is, like this looks sort of like it came from an exponential exact sequence, right? Like, um, 
like this hom into C star could be replaced with like X into Z and then hom into Z. Um, I think it's a good analogy even if it's not literally true. Um, sorry, I don't have anything more precisely to say right here, but hopefully that, that helps. Yes, okay. So in this formalism, so I was, I was not planning on getting really into the weeds about this, but mathematically when people talk about um, topological field theories, there's a, there's a Bordism category and there's a functor to something like vector spaces. And we're looking at fully extended theories, so the, the, these should be you know, higher categories. So reflection positivity. Re reflection means there is a, um, there's a Z2 action on the, the, the domain and the codomain category, and I want equivariance data for that action. And positivity says uh, something about the partition functions on um, manifolds which are obtained by taking two copies of a manifold and gluing them together along their boundary. So, um, yeah, so, so that's what that looks like. That definition works for the invertible case, but it seemed uh, work, like generalizing that to the non-invertible case is something that people are still working on. Uh, who's got more questions? Okay. Case. So the first part, this psi that I mentioned is uh, what's called the tangential structure. So it's basically what, what are the fields? So if I've got a theory with fermions, like what fields are needed to, to, make, to, make, it, to make this make sense? You better have something like a spin structure. Maybe you have like a spin C structure or something, but the, the point is you have to, based on the data of the theory, you need some structure. You need a spin structure if you want to have fermions. You need maybe a, maybe you have a principal U1 bundle so that you can do U1 gauge theory, things like that. And so Xi is saying, why don't I keep track of all of that? Uh, it's precisely the notion of tangential structure. And the thing to keep in mind is that this is topological. There, you can, there, there's no metrics, there's no connections, there's just the topological part of this structure. So if you have like, if you're doing like, if you have a background SO3 symmetry, yes, you need to couple to a connection to, to do that in physics, but we're leaving the connection out. We're just looking at principal SO3 bundles. So, um, and again, the point is in order to do physics, you have to specify what dimension you're in and you have to specify what, um, what structure is, um, is present on, on space-time. So now, we need, now I need to say what the heck this is, this omega and xi, n is the dimension, xi is the tangential structure, so what's omega? And so this is what's called a Bordism group. And so what we do is we say, okay, great, I'm gonna take all possible n manifolds uh, that are compact, or sorry, that are closed, right? So this should be an element of omega one SO. SO is saying that I'm looking at oriented bordism. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say all of these things become a commutative monoid under disjoint union. This is a very big monoid. And now I wanna say actually Let's kill the, the, the ones that are boundaries. Why would I do this? Well, there's various reasons. First of all, I, th I think it's cool. But second, the monoid goes from very big to very small. Very small. So usually it's not zero. But when you do this, if, if psi is reasonable, then this is always a finitely generated, well, it turns out actually an abelian group. And so the idea is, I want to I want to take a manifold, and it's and it's inverse, right? I always want to be able to take something, and and make sure that their disjoint union is a is a boundary. That that way I know that I, that I have a monoid with inverses, also known as an abelian group. And so the answer is always M with the opposite with the opposite psi structure. So in this case, it's going to be the opposite orientation. You know, if it was a spin structure, there's a notion of opposite spin structure, et cetera. And so um, there's a procedure for defining the opposite structure in general. So in doing this, you therefore obtain that this thing is actually an abelian group. And that's good, because they're easier to work with than monoids. And so this thing is called the n-dimensional psi bordism group. If, if you have heard the word cobordism and you're wondering how it's related, um, 
This is this thing that like people do sometimes where they say, where like confusion of notation, but boardism and cobordism more or less mean the same thing. Sometimes people use them for different things, but I'm not gonna. So if you like, so don't worry about the difference between those. Probably the only time a mathematician says this and co-this are the same. So now let's go back to this, uh, to this uh, theorem. So what we've learned is that the group of invertible field theories is, well, there's, there's, there's a torsion part, which is homomorphisms from this boredism group. So functions on manifolds, closed manifolds, which are multiplicative under disjoint union and which vanish on any manifold which is a boundary. So, um, you know, you might be thinking about Stokes' theorem as an example of this. And, you know, we can, we can take that thing and hom it into C star. And then we can take this other thing and hom it into Z. So we want to calculate these boredism groups because once you know a finitely generated abelian group, homs into C star and homs into Z are pretty straightforward. And then there's the question of the extension. But I have a torsion group and a free group and an extension here. And that extension has to split, just non-canonically. So if we want to know, I have a theory, what are all of its possible anomalies? Well, let's calculate some boredism groups and then we'll have the answer. Moreover, this, long, this short exact sequence that I just sort of threw up here has physical meaning. So let's say that you have a theory, a quantum field theory with an anomaly. Well, how, how might we access it? What's the first thing we do? Work perturbatively. And if you work perturbatively, you end up discovering something called the anomaly polynomial. And the point is that the perturbative information is what's left when you pass to the quotient. So people might call that the local anomaly or the perturbative anomaly or something. But there's also stuff that's invisible, right? So let's say that you know that the perturbative anomaly is zero. Let's say you've killed the anomaly polynomial somehow. Well, there's still some information here. There's some non-perturbative information, sometimes called the global anomaly, and that is still present. So this is, this is why this, um, like, part of the reason I like the methods I do is because they don't care. They are equally good at them. And, um, you know, people, not me, are very, very good at perturbative things. So it's nice to have methods which complement that. So if you're wondering how n and n plus 1 became n plus 1 and n plus 2, if I have an n-dimensional theory, the anomaly is n plus 1-dimensional. And so we had to shift this thing up 1. So as I mentioned, you know, people have, like for the typical examples I'm gonna study, I'm gonna talk about, you know, the perturbative story is understood. Like someone came along in the 80s and said, if you do this, this, and this, then your perturbative anomaly is zero. So therefore this thing is solved. And as I mentioned, there's a, not, there's a, there's a global anomaly question too. And so that's what I'm gonna uh, focus on. Yes? So as you said, there is no canonical choice of splitting, right? Uh -huh. So it means that there is no canonical way of deciding which part is global and which part is, is perturbative. Uh, yes and no. So, well, yes, yeah, sorry. But the, so you're right that you can't split it. But if you know something is zero in here, then you know that it pulls back here. Okay, so, okay, I understand. So you're absolutely right. I can't say here is, a, here is an anomaly. Here's the global part. Here's the perturbative part. But if I know, if I've trivialized the quotient, then I know that I have, I'm, I'm in the sum. Does that address your question? Great. Uh, who else has questions? Okay. So, okay, we're back. We're in the, in the sub. So that means that we should be studying boredism invariance, these homomorphism out of omega n plus one. You know, landing in C star. So, as I mentioned, let's, fi let's figure out what this thing is. How does this point? Um, I was pushing the wrong button, how was that? So let's figure out what this is. And using that, if you have some theory that you're interested in, once, once we know what the, the group is, once we know what manifolds represent generators, now we can understand the anomaly better. Typically we want the anomaly to go away, and so we can just calculate it on the generators and see that it does that. So one of the best case scenarios that, that you can be in is you can say, wow, my boredism group is zero, therefore there cannot be an anomaly. You didn't have to do any thinking, you didn't have to do any calculation, you just said, look at that. There's no anomaly because there can't be one. And so, okay, what's really going on is that all the hard work was in that theorem that, sh that said, well, okay, this thing is 
abortism invariant, right? That, that carries some significant information. And maybe this calculation is harder in higher dimensions. So, you know, this is sort of, this is the happy answer, where, where, um, where you don't have to worry about anomaly cancellation. It sort of comes for free. So I mentioned omega-1. Another example is oriented uh, two-dimensional abortism, right? So think about, think about the best donut you've ever eaten. Maybe, maybe it had multiple components, right? You know, some donut shops sell multi-hole donuts. And think about the boundary of that donut, right, the outside. So every, every uh, surface of genus G, no boundary components, is itself a boundary where you fill it in with the donut material. And that, you know, that is a delicious proof that the, that the bordism group there vanishes. So if I had a, uh, a one-dimensional theory on just with the, only an orientation as, like, as the fields, then its anomaly must vanish because, well, there's nothing in uh, the second bordism group. So, you know, somehow we did, like, you didn't have to work very hard in that case. So here's a case where one would have to work a little harder, which is the E8 cross E8 heterotic string. Um, so in particular, we're in 10 dimensions now. And so now the, the nice geometric reasoning for bordism groups is essentially impossible and people calculate them in other ways. So what do we start with? So what is this string theory? We've got the data, we've got some fermions, so we better have a spin structure. And we've got E8 cross E8, which means two E8 bundles, P and Q going to M. And now I said we better cancel the, we better work in a situation where the perturbative anomaly goes away. So this is the Green Schwartz mechanism. And what it says is that if you make, if you, if you assume that the following is zero, Better actually is to say that I have provided data trivializing it. So you could think, so you might say, okay, this is a cohomology class. So let me produce a co let me produce a cochain, which uh, witnesses the fact that this is a co-boundary, right? By taking the uh, by taking the, the co-boundary map. Or you might think of this as a map to KZ4, and you want an a null homotopy of that. Data trivializing this, just like an orientation is a trivialization of W1. So. What is this? Well, um, if I have a spin manifold, then the, the first Pontragon class is canonically two times some other class, which um, I like to call lambda. You might like to call it one half P1. And C is, well, if you have a compact, simple, simply connected uh, Lie group, H4 is canonically Z, um, where you, know, you can distinguish one from minus one by insisting that the killing form is uh, positive, or the under this isomorphism. And so, okay, so we've got a canonical characteristic class of E8 bundles, and I'm gonna call that C. So what I need to know is I throw in this condition in the cohomology of it. So all of this data, um, which for ex is an example of what's called a twisted string structure, all of this data goes into the definition of Xi. The spin structure, the E8 bundles, the degree four Green-Schwartz data. So that's Xi. And now we want to know, you look at the problem and you say, well, is this feasible? Is this doable? How hard is it? And so it's, it's not always easy to know going in, but one good rule of thumb is where are you in the whitehead tower of the orthogonal group? And so what I mean by this is so a twisted blah structure. Well, what kinds of characteristic classes are you killing? So in unoriented boredism, so there's no data at all, that is the easiest kind of boredism. You killed no characteristic classes. So, um, no information. And so you've made fewer choices, and so the boredism problem ends up being easy. In fact, it's completely trivial. Uh, Rene Tom proved it, uh, a, long, a long time ago, essentially that it's a, um, it's, it's, Determined by mod 2 homology, you might think of it as the atiyah hertzberg spectral sequence instantly collapses, um, however you like to think about it. And, um, I mean, I think this is great. It's a, it's a very cool paper to read. So now let's say, well, why don't I ask for a little more? Why don't I say, I'd like the first Stiefel Whitney class of my manifold to go away? So this is not a, te this is not a terribly, you know, this is not a, a super demanding demand. And so this thing was studied by, by Brown Peterson, and then the, the, the key fact was, uh, the key work was done by Wall in 1960. And the theorem is that it's mostly determined by integral homology. Um, there's a couple headaches, but they're not so bad usually. 
And you can sort of, especially in physically relevant dimensions, you can plan for them and work around them. But, so it's a little harder. Now, I want a spin structure or something like it, a twisted spin structure, a spin C structure, a pin minus structure, things of that form. I have some kind of field theory and it's got fermions. Now I'm in this regime. And now things are more of a headache. Wall wrote in the beginning of his paper, if one thinks that my results are, are complicated, they should try working it out for the spin group. And Anderson Brown Peterson did, not that long after. And they, they produced a complete uh, description. If you're trying to take spin boardism of something, it can start to get a little bit feisty. But ultimately, you know, it's more difficult than oriented, but still, you know, you should still try it. It's still likely to work. Now, let us ask for one more thing. Thank you. Now let's ask for a string structure or a twisted string structure. The string boardism groups are not known. If you, if you figure them out in dimensions higher than 49, that's, you know, that's a new result. If you figure them out in all dimensions, that's something that homotopy theorists would be very impressed with. Um, depending, on, depending on exactly how you go about it, you might resolve like a, you know, a particularly feisty open question that people have been interested in for a while. But here, you know, Giambalvo, Hovey and Raveno, Mahowald and Gorbunov have made, some good, have made some good strides. Now, here we care about dimensions up to 11. So this doesn't really come into play. But even in the physically relevant dimensions, this is still harder than spin boardism. You know, you get more structure, which is good, but typically this is, this is just a, you know, the computation's worse. So we, in the example of EA times EA heterotic string theory, you know, we're looking at a twisted string structure. So we should be worried, right? But it turns out that you can make this problem go away and reduce to a twisted spin board. Well, just an, yeah, just a twisted spin boardism computation. So the, the gist is an E8 bundle in, in dimensions, I think it's 15 and below, um, certainly in dimensions 12 and below, is equivalent data to its characteristic class C. So you can say, well, I, have, I want just two characteristic classes, uh, P and Q, such that lambda of M minus P minus Q equals zero. So then that, once I know P, Q is uniquely determined, so, that, so the, um, the Green-Schwartz condition goes away, you have a twisted spin structure, and now, you, now that's much more easy to calculate. And so, string. What if you think the gauge group is actually E8 cross E8 semi-direct Z2, where the Z2 permutes the two factors? I have really good news for what's gonna happen in a couple slides. Um, but yes, you're exactly right. The argument I gave is not symmetric in the E8s. And um, in its own way, that you could think of that as a, as, a, as a big headache or as a fun problem to work on. So yeah, I'll say something more about that in a moment. But yeah, if, you do, if, you, if you're okay breaking that symmetry, you have an easier computation. And what you learn, and this is something where um, I think Strong uh, worked with the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence. It's a, you know, that might be a nice one, a nice example to try out. Though, warning, I haven't personally done it, so I don't know, I, don't know. I, I, I learned this a different method. So, the Bordeson group vanishes, though, and what that means, no anomaly, without having to think about anything other than what was the structure that we needed. So that's a nice theorem. Um, so, um, what I wanted to mention is, well, what if the Bordeson group is non-zero? Then you have to work a little harder. And um, it might still be that the anomaly vanishes. So how would you do that? You, find, you figure out what the Bordeson group is, you figure out a set of manifolds that generate it, and then you just calculate the anomaly on each generator. And hopefully the generating set is small. Now usually it is. So here's some examples where, um, where there's plenty of examples of people doing this. I wanted to highlight um, some examples. So um, Dan Fried and Mike Hopkins looked at the uh, the Z2 parity symmetry in M theory, and their generating set had six manifolds. And then in joint work with Matt, uh, Matthew Yu, we, we looked at U-duality in four dimensions, although not the most general case. And then the other two papers are what I'm about to talk about next, which is about heterotic string theory with the Z2 uh, action. So E8 times E8 semi-direct Z2 as the gauge group. So, okay, we've got this symmetry. Is it anomalous? And because, um, so you might say, well, why on earth should I care about it? But there is this thing in, in nine dimensions called the CHL string, which is a compactification of the EA times EA heterotic string, 
where, the, where um, essentially on a circle with the non-trivial Z2 bundle, switching those two E8s. So if this Z2 symmetry is anomalous, that is a problem for the CHL string. So, you know, if you're interested in the CHL string, you should go check that this anomaly is actually uh, zero so that this thing is well-defined. To be clear, enough consistency checks have been performed that no one seriously thought this is going to be a problem, so that's fine. So, you know, we're gonna do a lot of work and get zero out in the end. You know, it happens, it's, wor it's worth doing these consistency checks. And then as mentioned, Witten's argument breaks the Z2 symmetry, so yep, you have to work harder. So, um, so this is actually, this, this is a, a problem that I investigated joint with um, Ivano Basile, Matilda Delgado, and Miguel Montero. And so what we discovered, we did not calculate the Bordesen group. We mostly calculated it. It's gonna be, it's one of these four abelian groups of order 64, and it's generated by these two things. So one of them is the, um, the bot manifold times RP3. What is a bot manifold? If it is a, um, it's a, it's an eight dimensional spin manifold, which is, um, there's different definitions, but you can, but you can, you can think of it as it has, um, let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this wrong. So maybe the right way to say it is, if you think of the, the index of a spin manifold as an element of K theory, then this thing lands in K08. And in K08, there's, there's a class called the bot periodicity class, which implements the fact that K theory is a periodic. And the index of the bot manifold is that class. So that's how you know a bot manifold is a bot manifold. It, that, that doesn't uniquely characterize it, but um, we didn't need to know which one we had. So the first one is bot times RP3. And the second one is you take a certain S4 times S4 bundle over RP3. So, okay, if, if this group is actually Z mod 64, then this is redundant, but that's okay. And then, well, we, we figured out what the anomaly is on these two generators and we discovered, wow, it's zero. So the CHL string is okay. And I do wanna mention, there's this really cool work of Yuji Tachikawa and Mayuko Yamashita who provide a different argument that this anomaly and a lot of other anomalies should vanish. And, you know, from the, if, if you have your physics hat on, what they're doing, you know, it makes, it makes sense that it's, that it's equivalent to what we're doing, but even though they don't touch, like they're not checking on borders and groups, they didn't calculate this borders and group, they're doing something different with TMF. But it is not a mathematical theorem that these, that these two approaches are the same. So it was good, you know, it's good to have a consistency check. So how do we calculate the Bordesen group? And the answer is, well, I mentioned, it's homotopy theory. So Pontragon and, and Tom prove this theorem that says, well, you know, in separate papers, to be clear, that says if you want to calculate Bordesen groups, rather than drawing pictures, you could simply compute homotopy groups. Much easier. Um, well, in higher dimensions. And so the thing that you're computing the homotopy groups of, it's called a Tom spectrum. Um, and so what are we going to do? So I'm gonna be a little bit vague about the details here just because of time reasons, but if you wanna know more details, please come talk to me. I love talking about this stuff and I'd be happy to work, work, from, uh, work some examples with you because it's, I think it's a lot of fun. It's why I got involved in all this stuff. So the gist of it is let's really do this from the algebraic topology perspective, which is the idea that if I extract algebraic invariance out of topological spaces, well, if you really just sit there and try and wring as much algebraic structure as you can out of this thing, there's a lot. So for example, cohomology groups are acted on by the Steenrod algebra of all the possible operations you could do universally on cohomology. That's a big algebra. That gives us a lot of structure. And if you think about it, well, these invariants are telling you something about the space. So topological information is constraining the algebraic information. So we turn it around. If you know that that's constrained, maybe you can say, well, I computed the algebraic information it satisfies those constraints, therefore I learned something about topology. Now, working by hand like that is very hard and not so many people do it. And it's much better to try and do this systematically, to, to, to build machines and then use machines which organize that information. So a lot of constructions in algebraic topology, they look scary, but they're not like, it's not that they're hard, it's more that there's just a lot of pieces. And so you, know, you have your machine, you turn the crank, you watch that the gears flow, and then sure enough you get your answer. 
And you go back and look, and sure, you have to, you know, maybe you have to, to check some lemmas, but it's not as bad as it looks. And so, as, as you may have guessed, that's, that's how I'm trying to motivate that spectral sequences are a reasonable thing. Unfortunately, even in the math community, spectral sequences are a little bit intimidating. So here's what Ravi Vakil has to say about them. If you have not read Ravi Vakil's algebraic geometry notes, or at least taken a look, they're really wonderful. Um, his voice really shines through in things like this and many others. And he has a good introduction to spectral sequences with all the details. So what's the story? The story is you, you, you begin with an approximation of the right answer called the E2 page. And um, if you're wondering what happened to the E1 page, that's usually uh, used in setting up the spectral sequence. So you sort of, you know, you, you begin at, at the beginning, not, at the, not with the preface or introduction. And there are successive pages that you have to calculate, which make the approximation closer and closer to the correct answer. So when I say until you get the correct answer, there's one nuance called an extension problem that I'm not going to get into right now. But, um, but the point is, if you've gotten all the way to the end, you're pretty close. And again, there's a lot of moving parts. But the point is, those moving parts obey rules in the form of lemmas and theorems that say, this is what you should expect to happen, or this is what does happen. And so all that extra structure helps you know, it helps constrain. It means you only need a little bit of information. Cha you know, apply that structure to it, and you've got a lot of information that helps solve the problem. So in this computation that, that my collaborators and I did, we used something called the Adam spectral sequence. Um, and I'm not going to say too much more about where it, like, where it comes from. I just wanted to tell you, I just wanted to give you a picture. So this is the E2 page. The, um, uh-oh, sorry. So the x-axis uh, corresponds to di the dimension in bordism. So we're interested in this column labeled 11. Uh, the y-axis is something called the Adams filtration that is not so relevant to directly right now. If you have two points connected by a vertical line, well, each point represents a Z mod 2, and the vertical line says they're related, as, a, um, as in, for example, a Z mod 4, a Z mod 8. But the converse is not true. So in, in dimension 11, we see we have three dots here, that's a Z8, three dots here, that's a Z8. There may be another, there may be a, a way that they're mixed too, right? They might be Z8 plus Z8, Z16 plus Z4, Z32 plus Z2, or Z64. The other, the other uh, lines are extra structure. The slope one is saying taking the product with the non-bounding circle. Uh, this one is taking the product with S3 with one unit of H flux. And there's other structure not depicted. So for example, you see how this orange triangle and this orange triangle look exactly the same? It turns out that you can, you can say algebraically like there is some, there's some piece of the spectral sequence, like some element, which taking the product with it sends P1 all the way up to this class and takes this whole triangle and moves it up here. And that algebraic structure, you're looking at it, you're like, wow, there's too much information. Well, that, the, you know, you, there's a general theorem that says that is the class of the bot manifold. So if you know that P3 is RP3, which this is in like geometric dimensions, so that's something you can figure out without having to worry about homotopy theory, then you know that this thing up here is the bot manifold times RP3. So that's how we did that. Getting the class D required a little more work, but um, I can, but it ended up, uh, I can talk about more, more about that offline if you're interested. But the point is, see that there's a lot of structure here, and that structure gives, uh, gives you the information you need. Oh, okay. So, uh, the differentials, the, gray, the grays are the differentials, they're going up and, so DR goes over one up R. So um, in the atom spectral sequence, this is not, so this is not the same grading that people use in a tier Hertz Brook. Like really strictly speaking, um, it should be S and T, and then the differentials would be the same as a tier Hertz Brook or Sayer. But you, see, you can see how um, it's T minus S and S. And so that's why the differentials have this kind of funky looking form. And it has the advantage that vertical lines are the things you're trying to compute. Yeah. So the grade, the solid differential I know is, is uh, non-zero. The dash differentials we left open, later I checked, I think they are zero. So, we don't, so you don't even have to worry about that. So, we, so just to summarize, we did this computation, we figured out what the borders and groups were, and then in dimension 11, that's really the one that we're interested in, the, um, the, it turned out that the two generators, the anomaly vanishes on them. So rather than having to check on all 11 manifolds with the right structure, we just checked on two, and we discovered they're zero. Or the anomaly is zero. So
so I've got just a couple minutes. So I'm going to talk about the one case where the anomaly does not vanish, and then I'm going to say a little bit about what, uh, some things that might be fun to think about in the future. So it's not necessarily terrible that anomalies uh, vanish, but if you have two dual theories, dual in the sense of physics, meaning isomorphic, then they better have the same anomaly. So if you checked one side of the duality and you discovered the anomaly is zero, and you checked the other side of the anomaly, or the other side of the duality and you discovered the anomaly is non-zero, you have a problem. And there's lots of string dualities. There's lots, that, that's lots of places for things to, to possibly go wrong. So in particular, type 2B string theory with this duality symmetry, lots of consistency checks performed on that, the anomaly better vanish. So um, as, as you can tell by the red text, maybe, maybe something funny is going to happen. So I'm going to go over this a little bit fast due to time, but the tangential structure is, it's a twisted spin structure. I'm looking for a, you know, the structure group to go from GL and R to spin times the metaplectic group mod plus minus one. But if you include the world sheet uh, orientation reversal, you can actually uh, extend to the pin plus cover of GL2. So these are twisted spin structures. So this computation is easier than, um, than the one I discussed before. Um, it's there, this, this paper of Agnes Beaudry and Jonathan Campbell, it, you should check it out. It's a really good introduction to these kinds of things. And really it comes down to how bad is GL2Z's classifying space? How bad algebra topologically is it? The answer is it's pretty great. You can replace it with, that, with the dihedral group and now you're doing great. Like things are pretty straightforward. So here's the spectral sequence. It's again an atom spectral sequence. So we're interested in dimension 11. And this is the E2 page. And this looks bad. There's so much stuff here. But there's a lot of differentials. So when you're done at E infinity, you just have this thing. There's four copies of Z2 here. And then these three are going to combine to a Z8, um, which I can say more about um, offline if, if anyone wants to know more about it. So we calculated the Bordesen group. Um, so this is me, Marcus D. Regal, Jonathan Heckman. I'm sorry I left an M out of his name. Um, so sorry for the confusion. And then Miguel Montero. So we got the Bordesen group. Um, there's some stuff, there's some three primary torsion that I didn't show in the spectral sequence that we found using a different spectral sequence. But look at this group, it's big. It's generated by these manifolds. Um, you know, these are some names for some manifolds. And okay, you have to, um, you have to figure out what the anomaly is. There's a term, for, there's an eta invariant associated to fermions. Um, and the self-dual field's contribution is a little more interesting, worked out by Xie, Tachikawa, and Yonakura. And um, it's something to do with an ARF invariant and a quadratic refinement of the torsion linking Perry. And so what we discovered is something truly concerning, that the anomaly is not zero. Like, this, this is not good. This, this, this S duality really ought to, ought to exist. Like, th this theory should not be anomalous. This, this is like kind of concerning. String theory ought to be there, right? And there's, so this is not the end. One thing you could do is you could insert a correction term into the 2B action that makes this problem go away. And this seems parsimonious because there is a term that works and it only works, like you can only do this for the specific anomaly that we found. And so th this is one of these like string theory coincidences that keeps lining up. So that suggests that this is really something canonical. Another thing that you might say is, wait, shouldn't the, um, shouldn't the type 2B, um, are our fields be quantized in K theory and not cohomology? Yeah, but like, it seems, th th this is not something that, that we were gonna resolve in this paper. Reconciling S duality and K theory, like no one knows how to do it as far as I know, it's an open problem. And so we don't like, that, so maybe the sign is, well, we should have been using K theory, but I don't know how to reconcile those. So at least for the part of GL2 plus that we know how acts on K theory, which is a pretty small part, it'd be really interesting to say, actually, let's, re, let's run this calculation for K theory and see if it makes the problem go away. So in, in the last minute, I'm gonna mention um, actually just one thing that, that um, is some work in progress with Matthew Yu that I, that I think is interesting. So um, Sanath Devalopurkar has defined something called a string H structure. And this is the string version of a spin C structure. There's also, so when I say that, there's different things you might mean. So if you're thinking about something called a string C structure, this is different, and it generalizes in a different way. So what we've, what we've learned is that this thing looks an awful lot like, like the uh, data needed for type 2A, in, and um, in particular, a string H structure gives you the condition big W7, the integral Stiefel Whitney class, vanishes, which is the condition that Diaconescu, Moore, and Witten um, discovered when studying type 2A you know, in their paper. So this is, this is an interesting suggestion that somehow in type 2A string theory, 
some sort of, some sort of string H structure or twisted string H structure is behind anomaly cancellation. Moreover, another uh, calculation that Devla Purkar made, uh, it's a purely homotopical ca computation, and its consequence is that string H boardism is easier to calculate, usually, than string boardism. So, well, uh, what we are in the progress of doing is figuring out exactly the relationship between 2A backgrounds and, two, and what's needed for 2A string theory and string H structures, and hopefully using that to, get to um, produce some easier than the string computations of anomalies. So um, I am out of both time and slides. So thanks so much for, for your attention. Thanks so much for your questions. And yeah, does anyone have any more questions? Uh, is there a guess for what kind of structure to think of in M theory? So um, I mentioned a while back there's this, um, let's see. So there was this paper of Fried Hopkins that I mentioned. Um, yeah, Fried Hopkins, uh, it's called like consistency of M theory on unoriented manifolds or something, to, something like that. I don't remember the exact title. And so they answer the question of what is the structure, well, Okay, let me be careful. I don't know if they were the first people to say what is the structure in M theory, but they calculated the boardism group for it. And so that is so that that structure is known. It's a pin plus structure, and a lift of the fourth Schieffel Whitney class to uh, twisted co cohomology for the orientation bundle. So um, so maybe if you add extra structure to M theory, like brains or something, then then you get some like then there's more open questions there. I'm not really sure, but certainly as it's, um, like, just, with just that stuff, it is known. I see, yes, because I'm, what I'm curious about is, like, if I add the G4 flux or something like that. Oh, yeah. So the then you have the, this kind of non-billion twi twisted condition come from the G4 flux, right? It's kind of hard to think of how the, like, what kind of a structure you should think of, I guess. So, okay, so what I know is that Fried Hopkins did consider the, the G4 flux. That's their integer lift of w, W4. I, the word non-abelian makes me worried that, that I am not talking about the thing you're talking about. Um, I'm not sure. At the very least, let's talk about this some more um, sometime this week. But if I, so either their, their answer, th their formalism is a direct answer to your question, or if that's not true, then I think what you've done, like what you're asking about has not been done yet. That, that's Thanks. what I think. Thanks. So, so going back to the SL2Z um, anomaly in 2B, yes. so where in that calculation did you use the, that uh, Ramon uh, fluxes should be classified by singular homology? So um, let's see. Where is the, um, where did I mention? Let's see. Yeah, there. Yeah. So where, where, where is that making a particular choice of generalized cohomology theory for the Ramon sector? So one answer to this is that at the very beginning, the fact that we have, like, okay, so here's maybe a concrete answer, which is one of the terms in the anomaly is the, you know, is associated to the self-dual field. Right. And, um, oh, and so, so, you so take, it's the like, way you handle the self-dual phi form. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, the fact I that see. We, we have I the torsion yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, not okay. A K theory. So maybe we should take. So you found the anomaly is not zero. Yeah. So S duality is wrong. Well. Wait, wait, wait. Let me finish. Okay. So, well, there's a meta theorem that S duality holds. So um, isn't the conclusion that uh, that's the wrong generalized cohomology theory for the uh, Ramon sector? I think that's a fair conclusion, but. Um, but then, like, you know, how do we reconcile it with, with, S, with SL2Z? Yeah. Well, that, that's why I think this, this K-theory computation would be cool. Because if the small amount that we do know how to do makes the problem go away, that's a really strong sign that that's the direction we should be going in. Oh, no, I, I, it's, it's some, I think it would be fun to do, but I haven't worked on it. There are some, there are some elements. 
There's some elements, of course, of the SL2Z group that are not going to uh, take you from weak to strong coupling. So it, it better vanish for those. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th I think that would be a, that would be a good thing to do. Um, I think you, there was a section that you passed over on um, orbifold and not, um, anomalies. Yes. Is there like a canonical kind of answer to what these are supposed to be? So, um, I mean, in the sense of like, what's the mathematical formalism behind them or what kind of boardism yes. should go in? Yeah, that. So part of the question is like, well, things to study. What's the answer to that question? But I, there, people have definitely, um, so I learned about this thing. I didn't come up with this idea myself. I learned it from um, Miguel Montero, who had talked to a couple other people about it. The question is, okay, if we're looking at orbifolds, which are it's sort of locally, they're like manifolds with a group action, then maybe what we want is boardism of manifolds with a group action, or boardism of orbifolds, something like that. And if you, start, if you, if you tell this question to homotopy theorists, they will say, yeah, we have some answers on that. Like, you can set the theory up, but the computations are quite hard. And so th this bolded question of like, well, what is the classification of invertible field theories on, like, on orbifolds? That would be a, that's, a, that's a pure math question whose answer would be, would be sort of the key to unlock this proof strategy for anomalies on orbifolds. Okay. Was that, was that a, the kind of answer you were looking for? Yeah. Thank okay, you. cool. I didn't quite get something toward the end. Um, I think you mentioned that to fix this issue of sl 2 d in type 2B, you also had the possibility to add a term in the type 2B action, is mm -hmm. that right? Is what? Is, is it right that you can add a term in the, SL, in the type 2B action to fix it? So that's what we did and uh, to make it go away. Yeah, but this is quite confusing for me um, because typically, you cannot cancel anomalies or modify anomalies by just adding term to the action. Anomalies are supposed to be robust under the formations. So either you do something very drastic or you have to add fields. So why is this working? So when you say because adding terms to an action, you can like scale it down to zero and it has to go away? Well. Maybe, okay, I'm not sure if this is an answer to your question, but the term we added is torsion. And so that means it's hard, like, that, you know, the, the discreteness of that, it might be the robustness that you're looking for. Oh, okay, see, so it's not something with a tunable parameter. No, okay. no it's just, it, 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 it's that and you can't do anything with it. So it's a, it's a very drastic modification of, a, okay, thank you. Uh, I, I want to, uh, uh, you, you mentioned the, that corporatism and boardism are basically the same thing. Can you please elaborate? Ah, okay, so boardism and co-boardism. So, it, you know, when people first started thinking about this, they said co-boardism, as in this and this, jointly bound, they co-bound this thing. So co-boardism. Then um, Atiyah wrote this paper called Boardism and Co-boardism, where he pointed out that co-boardism of manifolds with a map to some, to some space, right? So, you have a background field, which is a map to, to some space. That thing is a generalized homology theory in the space that you're mapping to. And so he said, well, the generalized homology theory should be called boardism, and the generalized cohomology theory should be called co-boardism. Makes sense? And so, um, so now we have a state of general confusion, because some physicists and mathematicians say co-boardism for boardism, and other people say boardism, and very few very infrequently, but sometimes, do people talk about cobordism, the cohomology theory. So um, I think boardism is the best because it's unambiguous, but it does have the disadvantage that sometimes it's confusing because people know what cobordism is, but then they're like, well, what is boardism? Yeah. What's the term? What? I mean, it's some formula in terms of, in terms of a, an SL2 bundle. Like, I do not have it memorized and didn't include it in the slide, but it is there in our paper. But it's like, basically, um, take, take some mod two and mod, and, sorry, mod three and mod four cohomology classes of your SL2 bundle, you know, 
do some stuff to them and then integrate it. I'm sorry for a less for an inexplicit description. Would would that the term change the quantization of charges? I'm not sure. Honestly, this is something that I remember like this you should be able to see this term downstream and like for example in compactifications and probably also in the way you mentioned. And so like when we were writing this we did we did do a couple tests of like well, can we see this in these in these ways? And I think what we found this was a couple years ago. I'm not, I don't remember for sure, but it wasn't, we didn't find anything that said this term is wrong, but we didn't find any smoking gun that said this has been here the whole time waiting to be discovered. So, um, is, is the SL2 action? Is the second term, would it be, be non-zero on circle bundles? Um, what's the SL2 bundle on that, on the restricted? Well, oh, hmm. I don't, I don't think I'd be able to answer that at the, at the chalkboard. Or, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's non-zero in circle bundles, then by t-duality, you ought to see this term in 2A. I'd be very surprised if there's a new term in 2A. Because of very, I mean, with this kind of science, it's been pretty carefully tested with yes. the relation to M3. I mean, is there an analog of the cohomology versus K-theory well, I guess that would be just cohomology versus K-theory in 2A, wouldn't it? Um, wait, wait, in 2A and, and M3? No, sorry. Like, if we're, if we're do, since, since we did this with the RR fields cohomological, presumably this would be in 2A with, with cohomological RR field as opposed to K-theory. Well, we know that's wrong. Yeah, okay, so maybe that's, maybe that's what's going on. I mean, that, that doesn't agree with M3. Right. The things that we checked this against were uh, M-theory compactifications. Sorry, uh, just to clarify, in your very last slide, you, you had uh, this string edge structure, mm -hmm. structure and you tried to draw some analogy with spin C structures. Mm -hmm. So just to be sure, firstly, by spin C, you mean the lift to the C-fold covering of SO, SO, SO2 or? or? Uh, so spin C means this. Um, so, Spin C is, so spin is saying W2 is zero. But we don't always have that. Sometimes you have that, um, that W2 is W2 of some U1 bundle. So maybe a complex line bundle. So it's not quite a spin structure, but it's pretty close. And um, string H, so usually for string, you say it's spin plus when half P1 is zero. What we are saying instead is that it's uh, spin C and lambda is, um, gosh, what's the right way to say this? I wanna say it's the, I think I got myself in a trap because there was an easier way to explain spin C, but, but, but there should be, or there was a better way to explain this, but I think it should be, um, Fine. Um, there is. Actually, yeah, sorry. It's just spin and it's C2 of a complex vector bundle. Okay, I, I think this is not quite right. So um, it's something to do with ha what's happening with C1 and W2 that is the problem, but this is roughly correct. And this is the sense in which it's an analog. And why, why should we ask for a vector bundle here and not a line bundle? That's sort of, you know, that, that's, um, that, that, that's not something that maybe I, I, I know why I think it's useful which is that you, know, you have vector bundles in string theory, but why uh, Devlo Perkar came up with it was for different reasons. Okay, we can discuss, I think. Sure. I just have like a basic confusion. What does it mean to put a torsion class underneath an integral and get something other than zero? Right, so um, the answer here is um, if your integral is valued in like C star cohomology, like 
if, you're, if you take a, a torsion class, you can put it in like U1 cohomology, and then you can integrate that to get, a, to get an element of U1. So that, that's what we did. But yeah, I guess that wasn't clear. Uh, any more questions? Is the way to cancel the type to be anomaly unique? Because usually if you have anomaly, you want to cancel that. I mean, you can, sometimes you can just add some gap, sorry, you can add some gap to degrees of freedom and there might be multiple ways to cancel the anomaly. Does this mean, I mean, if it's not unique, does this mean we have multiple type to be regularities? So this is actually a really interesting question. So um, let's say for a moment that the that the um, the sort of the philo the philosophy of like well is this the right way to, to talk about the RR fields or whatever let's say that that's solved, which to be clear it isn't. Then, okay, what you get is that um, if you have two different ways of canceling the anomaly, their ratio is a theta angle, in like um, like a, th a thing you can add to the theory. And so in other words, it's something that's coming from omega ten. So there are going to be inequivalent ways to like. To, there's going to be different ways to do this because there's stuff in, ten, in uh, the, the 10th boardism group here. So that's really funny, right? There shouldn't be, you know, there shouldn't be a bunch of 2Bs. But this problem, seem, this problem comes up. This is not just a problem that comes up because maybe we picked the wrong fields. Like if you, if you do this with other string theories where, there, where this problem doesn't arise, you still get potential theta angles. You still get these, um, you still get this, th what looks like this choice. And so this is an, uh, just a completely different question that should be investigated, which is, what are, you know, can we make these theta angles go away? And there's various physics arguments that people have used to argue that, that some of them are unphysical, and so that there really should be a unique choice of, of way to cancel the anomaly. But this is something that um, I don't know a lot about, and it's also, like, it has a pretty different flavor. So um, I don't know. That's something that should be done. Some of it is done. Sorry for a less, like, I don't know that that's a very complete answer. There are, so there are indeed nine unique choices to cancel this to be anomaly. Yes, but the expect sorry, yes, that's, that's right. And it's expected that, that the non-uniqueness goes away when you say, well, the, um, for string theoretic reasons, this, this one is invalid and this one is invalid. And then here's the only one that's left, or something like that. I see. OK, thanks. OK, uh, let, let's thank Arun again and uh, wait for another announcement. <laughs> <laughs>